Welcome, Walk Kitchen Brain, to our podcast on Talk to Kitchens. Um, it's an honor to have you here, Mark, because you've set records in the kitchen game that are unheard of locally and internationally. And uh, my opinion is you, you changed the whole landscape of pigeon racing in South Africa. Genetics that you brought in, the systems that you brought in, which we're gonna drag out of you now. And um, so, for us to have you here, it's an honor. And um, we're gonna sit back, relax, and enjoy the podcast. And, and uh, you can start off maybe by telling us how you got into pigeons because you come from a famous pigeon family. But strangely enough, you were the one that wasn't the, the pigeon guy. Yeah. So, take it from there, Mark. Because it's an interesting story. Russell, firstly, thank you for inviting me. I appreciate it. Um, pigeon racing, as you said, you know, has come to our family lineage. Mm-hmm. And um, my two great grandfathers were in Egypt. Uh, in the Second World War, they actually managed the pigeon loft. Oh, okay. So they used to they used to move the pigeon loft on, on wooden rollers mm-hmm. and give the lieutenants two pigeons, and the lieutenants would go out and release back to the loft. So obviously, the pigeon loft was a problem. But they used to move the lofts apparently up to 25 kilos a day. And obviously, being desert, the pigeons would, there weren't other buildings in the pigeons mm-hmm. you could obviously see the lot like and, then, and return. So I grew up, my dad, my dad flew pigeons from 1966. And a lot of guys said to me that, yes, Mark, you spent so much money on pigeons. But what they forget is, my dad in 1966 bought four pigeons from their stove. He paid 600 pounds at the time, which was massive money. And I mean, it's just, for guys, it's just for the guys who don't know, their stove was a, a yeah. it was super, super strong. And my dad was staying in, in, in the Free State at the time in Virginia, and that's where he started the club. So from 1966, I mean, there are photos where Billy sits in the pigeon bar as a baby, you know, and the pigeons are barking around him and whatever. So I literally grew up, you know, in the pigeons. But, but speaking to your, your brothers, and you were never really a pigeon. No, what happened was, my, my dad, my dad, I was very, I was very naughty guy, I was very, very active. You know, back then, if you, uh, you were active, you were naughty. You know, today they give you ribbons and you know, things like that. You know? So I, I was so active, and my dad had me cleaning the pigeon box. So before I had to clean those pigeon box, and I got so many hidings because of the pigeon box, I hated it. I just didn't want to. So when I was 18, I moved out and went instead to stay with my sister because I knew that was the end of my pigeon cleaning career. Sure, yeah. And it used to affect my nose. You know, I used to get, you know, blocked nose and yes, whatever yes, from yes. all the dust and things. Um, I can remember one one small story. My dad had a red hen, and uh, it was they had a red race, a red hen race, mm-hmm. and 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 this hen had already won. And the week that she had to participate. She was on eggs, and I was cleaning the loft. So I gripped her off the off the nest to release her, and I held on to the tail. And and so she was tailless, and that night I got a, I was whacked. My dad gave me a fight. <laughs> <laughs> I destroyed all of his chances. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, so yeah, I hated the pigeons. I literally hated them. I had wild birds. I had I had uh, a wild bird avery. I think they must. So you still had feathers in yours? Yeah, yeah. Right. I, I had small, you know, I had Cape Canaries, yellow eyes, king blues, you know. Uh, he still had that when I used to visit him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I had a huge ocean. I must have had 300 species of them. So that was my love. I yeah. still had feathers, yeah. but I didn't like the pigeons so much. And as the story goes, you know, when I started my business, you know, my dad came to work for me first, and then later Billy, and then Kim. And so we would end up in the boardroom. And for half an hour, we started talking. Where did you talk? How did you talk? What did you do? You out the conversation. And yeah, and I literally said to one day to them, I said, Listen, I want to fly pigeons. I mean, it looked like the guys were going to fall over backwards. You know, they were like long pigeons. Yeah. And, and I'll never forget, I think it was Kevin that said to Mark, You'll never become a pigeon fancy because you can't get up in the morning. I was a, I'm a night guy. You know, I'm, if you look at my phone, you know, I'm online at one o'clock in the morning. I'm really a night person and I'm better in the day and the mornings are better. So for that reason he said you'll never put your fancy. You're gonna be yeah. up early in the morning, you need to take your birds out, do your thing. 
And I said, boys, but I want to fly. And they went to Morabi prison, and there was a guy there flying pigeons, and, I, and they bought me this pigeon box. I don't want to lie to you, it was yellow. And it had, you know, it still had the dowels, mm. and the floors had gaps, I mean, you, you can't believe the lock that they bought me. But it was natural ventilation. But what I think, what I think is they bought me the lock because they thought this guy's going to last for six months in back out, you know. Mm. So let's buy him the cheapest lock we can get. And me being very competitive, and I've always played sport, I love cricket, and I love tennis, and I love playing golf, and all of these things. When you have that competitiveness in you, you know, at Leeds and Irish, you, you start to win. You want to be the best. And, and so you are. And the, I mean, that loft, I think, at the time was 10 meters long. With the loft, there was some of my dad's old blood out of the place he got. That's why I had of the old blood. And then I, I went through to Pretoria and I bought myself an acres plot. And the guy gave up. And there were birds sitting on the roof. And I said to him, what's going to happen to these birds? He said, if we sold them, they'd come back. If I can catch them, I can take them. Yeah. So I caught some of them. Yeah. Uh, and those were my old birds. You know, my old birds were the ones from, from the you know, from lock of these ones. And then Dale Lester was a very good pigeon fancy. I remember the name. Very, very underrated pigeon fancy as it's in Van Um He had out of the 1801 and Monty stuff. And and he bred me 30 babies. And so I started the first season with 30 babies and these old birds. And I went to the, I'll never forget, I went to the first AGM meeting, which is normally April. Mm -hmm. And uh, at that stage, a very famous pigeon fan, Peter Land, who was the chairman in Kempton. Mm -hmm. And Master Noon was flying there, and you know, Neil Humphries, there were a couple of very good. Pepsi Peterson was still flying there. Sure. You know, you know, in, in 1948, he told me the story. He brought in the very Janssen's. first Janssen's. Yeah. And why they called him Pepsi, he was the, he was the managing director of Pepsi Cola yeah. in South Africa. So he went to Belgium and he brought them back. And um, so my very first season, I walk into this AGM and I said to the guy, for all intense purposes, I'm a novice. I don't, I really, I don't even know what a hen nut box was. I promise you. Well, he used to come through and I used to toss the birds and then, you know, he would say, put the top 20 or 25 in one lot. Mm -hmm. And then he would come and pick 20, you know, mm -hmm. and, and actually write them from the end and top. I didn't, I didn't have a clue. Yeah. So my very first season, I said to these guys, I'm a novice, you need to help me. And those years, we still had the ringer. Yes. So they thought that he used the ringer because a lot of guys had the hand clocks. Yeah. Only one or two guys had the, the actual mm -hmm. electronics. And what, year, what year was this for? 2004. So, so for all intents and purposes, the very first year was just learning, seeing what guys are doing. And all that. But if you've got a competitive edge, you know, you want to win. Mm -hmm. And so the very first race I part, partook in um, was, I'll never forget it, they, they had a, those years they stayed at clock room. I think the clock room was in the room, room. And, and the rest of us sit, you know, yeah. outside. And I clocked my birds, and I went, I got my clocking, and, and Peter Ramsey came out of, the, out of the room, and he looked at me, he said, novice, novice, my ass. And so I physically won the very first race, I participated, I took first, second, and third. And I think when that happened, it was the end of the game. End of the game. Then I was bitten, then I was like, this is what I want to do, this mm -hmm. is what I'm going to do. And I mean, I literally, where I, I stayed at the, in I just, I just want to interrupt you there, that was the Kempton. Kempton. That was a very strong club. That was a very strong club. And uh, at that stage, I, you know, I, I, I bought a house. And remember, I was big. So my, my house, my property was 2,000 square. The house was 1,600. I used like four a day. There was no place for a big yeah. So I looked over the back wall. And I saw the big This guy's got a massive yard. So I went around the block. As, as it's funny. It's like a, you know, like a circle. Mm -hmm. I went and I knocked on his door. And, and the guy's name was Niels. I said, oh, Niels. This lot of yours, what do you do with it? He says, no, I'm so comfortable with this lot. I have to cut the grass and it takes me like two days, you know. So I said, but can I buy the piece of yard, you know, that I can put up a wall? Yeah. So he looked at him, he said, so what do you offer me? I said, 60 grand. He said, no. So two days later, I put up a wall. But as I'm putting up the wall, I look down the next to his house, I see there's a gap. So I said to him, listen, 
can I put a pipe handle? And I'll pay you another penny. And he said, done. So I put a pipe handle because where my house was, if I had to carry the so basket, it, it so now I could drive him onto the lawn no. and physically basket the birds and, and then go. No, no. And that was, so so that's where it started. And, and I mean, that box was 10 meters. When I looked again, it was 22 meters long. And I built one, built one. Mm. And then I built the stock lot. And then, so that was 2000, and well, I think I, I ended up with the world in the club. But I mean, it was literally worth also around. Yeah. Even the birds have got some day list that yeah. I, I had to pin them, you know, they were, they were too big. Too big to so, so I had to hone them and whatever. Yeah. And I must say, you know, I uh, one of one of the cocks that I got from day list at 3704, he actually, he, he was a triple winner for me. And he actually ended up in the car. I was fourth in the car. The car race. And, I, and that race I'll never forget because Kevin, Played a prank on me. You, you know, I always used to say, Kevin, he gave me 10 pack. I said, Kevin, when you clock, phone me. Yeah. And I can just make sure that I'm here. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, in any case, so uh, the car race is my first crap. Yeah. So, Kevin phones me, he says, I've clocked. But he, he doesn't say anything, he just says, I've clocked, and he puts the phone. Get an answer, and I'm sitting there. And it's 10 minutes, it's 15 minutes. And I, was, I mean, now I'm upset because now it's my race up, you yeah. know, I'm yeah. like, yeah. and this cock comes. From the airport side, kick the landing board, and I clock him, you know. And so now I phone Kevin. So I says, Kevin, I've clocked. He says to me, Don't talk shit. I said, I've clocked. I said, Why? He says, No, I haven't clocked. And so it was like, a, it was such a it moment was, quick. Yeah. And, and that clock got me fourth in the car race, and first prize money ever won. I won 4,000 rand um, in that race. You know, they even, that, that time the car race was more supportive. Car, you know, and I think I bought from you know, 4,000 rand. And uh, so 3704, 3727, 3728. I mean, my history with regards to numbers, people ask me numbers. I'll tell you this is this number, that number. I mean, the first, the, the, the next year, I got a phone call from my dad. He was flying in, in he was still busy in, in Albert, and he said to me, uh, Jan of Horses' son, I think his name was Ted of his boss. Yes, I remember a lot, and, a lot about it. Yeah, and, and Jana, and what happened was Jana, they, he had just bought a house and put a block up. Yeah. And Jana bred him 20 babies. Now, I mean, what do you breed for your son? You breed the best. Yes. So I went and I bought the 20 babies, bought them home, owned them. And that year it was my very first pig. Uh, 12712 was a cock that Jana bred that I then bought from him and, you know, broke him in and he won a pig. You won the pit. Yeah, I won the pit. That was my first pit. And that uh, was my second year in competing. But he's in my second year I won the club average. Uh, in our in, in Kim. Kim. The third year, I the third year was again I won the club average in Kempton. And then I got I really flew on. I, I, I ended up Oh so that was none of none of the imported birds you nothing, nothing, nothing none nothing. of those new strains. Nothing, nothing, it was just people. local. Obviously Kevin and Red. Yes, yes. Because they had time. Yeah. You know, I mean, when I saw the first one, there was no time. Yeah. You know? So so they bred from my dad and whatever it is, they bred me babies. And I got these 20 from Kevin. I mean, from uh, from Rana Borsa. I think, yeah. Yeah, and uh, no, no, so you all 20 of those birds. All 20 of them. I bought the 20 babies, owned them and I raced to them, and I won the averages. And the second, the, the following year, now I was really, I'd already started learning, yeah. you know, this and that, or what have you. I could already see what is a hen and a cock. It was a big for me. Yeah. That's a hen and that's a cock. And, you know, Russell, the biggest thing about racing cricket, and I think this is the difference between me and Kevin and Billy and my father, is that they were passionate about the game, but they were conditioned. It's and I call it conditioning. Explain it. I'll it's explain to you. I race, I race with Kevin and I rate him. Yeah, so let me explain yeah, let me explain conditioning. So so I get a bowl of porridge in the morning. My grandmother teaches me, I, I smear the butter mm -hmm. and I sprinkle the sugar and I put the porridge in the middle. Mm -hmm. Your grandmother teaches you, you put the porridge, you push the butter in the middle and you throw the sugar. Mm -hmm. After thirty years, who's right and who's wrong? I'm not gonna tell you your grandmother's wrong mm -hmm. and vice versa. And what I mean conditioning, they were told by the future previous generation, generations before that, how to fly pigeons. And so they stick to what they know. 
I come in as an unknown and I question everything. I question, but why do you toss like this? And why, why must the whole look like this? And why do you feed like that? And that was the difference. And the other difference is, so I wasn't. Although, you did, although you started off like that, I mean, you didn't. Yeah, I, no, I started off like that, but I actually realized. But, you know, I would say to them, I'd ask them a question, why, why do you give a breeding mix to, to, to the stock horse? And I'm going, why do you give minis to stock horse? And why do you give sunflowers? You know, what's the reason? You know? And so I think the questioning side took my game to a different level. I mean, you, you can't argue, you. You've learned from your predecessors yeah. and you apply it. Okay? I came in fresh and I took a business mentality. So I went and I said, you know, if I've got a business, I need a good product. I need, I need good marketing. I need good staff. I need good lighting. You understand? Um, that makes you successful in a business. So I went to a pigeon and I said, what are the main factors in, in, in a pigeon game? Number one, pigeons. Number two, your food. Number three, your 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 medication. Number four is your water source. And number five is your lot and your management and everything you've got. So I took a business stance and I said, this is a business. I'm running a business. And I need to not listen to what other people have said. You know what I'm saying? Yes, there are some basics if you listen. You make up your I need to go and investigate it. all five of these things okay, to become a champion. Because Russell, whether you family or not, you know, Billy and Kevin taught me to a certain point. When I started beating them, that teaching stopped, you know, and and they would help me less if I can put it to that way. So that's why, and, and being a hungry person to succeed, I went abroad, I went overseas, I, I went and found out what I needed to find out about those five categories. Now, we were talking earlier about the other horses. I'll never forget when, when obviously my first pet when I was not ready. So the next year I go back and I said, listen, you know, I want to buy uh, you know, some babies again. And um, he said, no problem, whatever. And there were two white white cocks I bought. So I said to my girl, you know, I'm not going to remember everything. Just write down 10 things for me that you believe are critical. And I'll never forget, he stood against the wall with his foot up against and they had a piece of paper and they put the point and then he like stood still and then he wrote another point it must have taken him five minutes and he gave me the piece of paper and I looked at the paper and it said excellent pigeon, number one number two, excellent pigeon number three, excellent pigeon all ten excellent oh, pigeon pigeon. Yeah. and then I realised that you know what 90% of racism not money is the pigeon himself. Okay? The rest. So what we so, have so, so what do you think um, in a broad spectrum of everything else we call it management, whether it be training, um, medication, housing, yeah. uh, all of that. You say ninety five well, I, I believe ninety percent the pigeon, ten percent the horse. Ten percent. Because you can you can you cannot make a donkey win the race. So, but at the same time, you can't make a sick thoroughbred and a pigeon. Yeah. So, so those two things are critical. Yeah. The genetics yeah. plays a massive role so in your performance. The other day I asked you a question, so just getting on to the genetics, which a lot of our, lot of our disagree and in some agree, and then I asked you a question and I'm going to ask you again now um, regarding inbreeding. Yes. Your opinion regarding that? Because, I mean, just. Answer the way you answered so, me then, because so regarding the chromosomes and, yeah. and all of that. So, so, so pigeons have 64 chromosomes in the genome on both sides. Yeah. And if you go look at the arguably the best pigeon ever, was the cannibal. Now, the cannibal won against 99,500 pigeons, and then later against 37,000 pigeons, and they put him to stock. And everything that he bred was super stocks. Now, if you go look at the cannibal pedigree, it was a full brother system. Now, I've done that, and Kevin has also done that many times. So, I'll have a full brother and sister. But what I'll make sure is that the cock will have, let's say, a punk and eye, and again, a white eye. So, there will be, be a variance in eyes, yeah. and I'll put them together. So, Alphonse Klaus taught me when I visited him. He's got a family that's now 55 years old. 
So the first task will be usually the first family, and you'll be babies for the right side. And then what you'll do is you'll buy in specific blood. So, you know, in my case, I went to Cedric McDermott. Mm-hmm. I went and I bought the five best pigeons, you know, the GPU hens and what have you. I'll take those five hens, make them to my cross, okay, breed babies. Now we have a couple of winners in the race stock. I take those winners back to the, right, the stock stock, but back to my family. The fault that people make is they bring in a bird. Let's say they bring in a, a Dikani bot, okay? a bloodline or, or, or a Turkman bloodline. Oh. And now, now, and they cross it to their family and it works. Then they go and buy more from that guy. And eventually you've lost your family. You've lost your identity. So the key is to keep your bloodline. So just explain that to you. So you say you bought, like you did with Cedric, you bought the five things. Yes. You brought them in, you made them. Yes. What did you do with those things after? So, so now I, I race with them. The babies. Yeah, I race the babies yeah. for the season. Yeah. Second season, if if they, if they didn't work, then obviously I sell them. Yeah. Straight away. If they work, I keep them for another season, and I breed, and then I sell them. Thank God. Because it's not my blood. Yeah. I wanted the, 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 the cross genetics to come into the blood. Yeah. I did the same with Leon Hamilton. I bought the fest. But I go and buy the combine winner. I go and buy, you know, the fed winner. He had a N4173, you know, 4,000 and so on. So I buy that mm-hmm. and I bring them to my OP lot. And I breed, race so just salt back to my OP. Give us, because that's become a famous, famous oh, name, I would say, for bloodline in, in, in the country is the OP line. Yes. So just give us a little bit of history on that OP. So, so Kevin invites me to Tom Gooding's uh, auction. Oh, he was the it was, it was, it was a, in Boxburg. So again, now you're talking 2007, started 2004. I don't know much. I really don't know anything about Boxburg. And you know, there's those rides outside. Yes, I was at the And I was riding with Roland Bauer and whatever, and we were carrying, you know. And so I had the catalog and I'm reading and I, and I checked the bird 17960 number. And I look at his pedigree and I've heard about the Pupi Yen. Mm. And about walk and all of these things. Very similar to the clock yeah, yeah. So, so I walk in and I haven't drawn this clock, but you're literally holding like this, you know. And I think for that reason, nobody bid on me. Mm. I bought him for 400 bucks. And But on that day, you know, I had a couple of brandies and whatever, and with the I didn't even have a, a, a basket. I put it in a little box they gave me in the booth. Now, about six months before that, Jeff Mortimer, my dad, was a very good friend. Now, I rate Jeff Mortimer as one of the best fanciers, short, middle distance in the country. He's an absolute superstar. What people don't realize, he could have won the Union Average a couple of times, but he does not buy the average. Mm-hmm. If there's an overnight, he sits out. So even if he's leading the averages, he sits out and he doesn't even stay in the Now, my dad introduced me to him, and, and his bloodline was around the Mortimer. Now, the Mortimer Cock was originally uh, the best pair from, from about 13 and 16. That was the Mortimer Cock. So, and he had read a, a, a bloodline around that. Um, on the one side, they were Bouchards, That's which, right. which happened, what happened was Jeff was a banker, and this one guy bought birds in, and when they got to the airport, he couldn't pay. And I exactly Jeff the paid. I actually know where those Bouchards came. They came from County Men. So, I'm, not, I'm not sure, but... But in any case, I mean, so the, name, Jeff, the name of that Bouchard was called Red Luck. That's 100% right. In any mean, case, I mean, so he bought these Bouchards with this guy, mm-hmm. and he then took the, 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 the Mortimer Cock and he, and, he, and he started breeding them. Right. He had unbelievable results. Now, if anybody talks about the Mortimer Cock, I mean, Uncle Jeff said to me that Tom Locke once said to him that the Mortimer Cock outbred it all. Uh, because what happened is the Mortimer Cock got to Jeff. For the following reason only. At that stage, he's, he's a 1997 one, one, one six, uh, 16929. Okay? And uh, the Mortimer clock was expensive then. Okay? Uh, Tom Lock bought two. He gave Jeff one because he's in the front. Uh, and he took one and four in the back. Right. And so the very first ride they were tossing and whatever, and the Mortimer clock apparently flew away from Jesse back. And the very first race he, he took part in, he got a third, and the next race he got a fourth, and then he came back with a bump win. Oh. And so Jeff phoned uh, 
performance in this one, this is going to have to be copy nominal in the price. So Tom said, look, I'm going to fetch him because we're going to not keep paying him. And about six months later, Jeff phoned me again, you know, your, your cock is here. So he said, man, just be with it. And that's when the winner of the winner was there. And then at one stage, Jay, uh, Tom actually came and lent him 15 books. And he bred with him. And he sold babies. And, and one of the famous babies he sold was to Chrysler. And Chrysler bred a couple of pet winners in Arabia and reading for them. And so there was many winners out of the many winners. So I went to Jeff and I bought his entire stock lot with the 33 pairs, including the most not lot. But he was old by then, he was yeah. 97. And what happened is he, he gave me a little blue egg, 18631. Uh, one and he said to me, 16831. He gave me this and he said, Mark, this is all you're paying for. The rest of the thing is not giving you. And so obviously I used high regard for this thing. And so I took her home. Now I buy this cock. And now I'm like a and so I'm driving home. home. Yeah, now I'm driving home and I'm scheming. Who am I going to pay this cock? And all I can think of is this blue egg. And so I drive home and without Naomi's knowledge, I open the gate and I slip in. I stop socks in the back. I grab the end. Quail in the box and I drive to Opaites from there. So I get to Opaites because he had single ones, I didn't have single ones. So I said to Opaites, Opaites, he's the thing you bet you get. And look, Opaites had an eye for it. I mean, he was ready to put in caps himself. Yes, yes. I think he won the union averages in 77, I still got the results. Those days it was only seven races, so certain races down the other Africans. So, in any case, so we threw them in there and there was literally only time. Big six. And I said, if I'll take four, you take two. That's the deal. Every year, I said, you can pick. So we bred the six. So the very first one was 6133 Chocolate Wonder. Uh, 6134, he kept between the second and the third. 6242, Whitney. Uh, 14553, Chocolate Wonder. 14554, Wonder. Um, what was the last one? But in any case, the sixth one was also a winner. Uh, six double one four one for him. So out of, I mean, six babies, six five six winners, six. you know. And what what I, what I like is six one double three won the short business. He won the he won. That was the very first bet that I literally saw the cock the whole week he was messing around. Mm. And I scratched the bird dead and I wrote him in. And it was Winberg fed he won for me. That same season from Smithfield, he got me a second bet, first club second bet. And the same season from Lukampa, first club eight feet. So short, middle, long. And so now all of a sudden this oak we got. But, uh, but it was so funny. So the oak we got with Tom Gooding Cock. Tom Gooding Cock, 1796. And, and later years, I actually, when I was going through the Fed book, the Fed yes. journals, yes. Uh, I mean, he's in 03. In 04, Tom Gooding, 1795, won in the union. So, you know, I never knew that. Uh, no, so, I just picked it up because of the numbers. I, yeah, I, I remember numbers. Yeah, I think it's yeah. And so, from there, the following year, obviously, uh, uh, Uncle, uh, I, got, I, got, I bred for him, and he bred me this cock, 19443, the white white cock, as part of our deal. And he bred himself a cock, uh, I think it's 4857, his number ends in 57. And he put his cock to stop because now all of a sudden he saw what was happening and you know, he couldn't even race it. And so he made me the white cock cock. And I, at that stage, I just moved from 551 to 44. My lofts were on this side of the house. I had, I had a stoop that ran about 12 meters. The, the loft was very close to the, to the boundary wall. So, so when the wind blows a certain way, they actually come down and land in the far end. And they have to walk or they if it's the other way that they, they land on this side and walk that way. Mm. And this cock, I'll never forget tossing him. He would sit on the pick of pickets. I looked at him and I said, I'm gonna kill you. I'm gonna kill you. Any case, season came he took the win. Now on record, that cock threw for me a first pick, a second pick, a second pick, a third pick, a fourth pick, and a fourteenth pick. He should have won all, all of them. He literally would drop, walk. And I'm you, you know, with a pig, you're not nervous. And so I'd walk slowly with it. And then he'd use the pig with one second or three seconds or four seconds. He 
He literally could be the sixth fed winner. And he was the best bird in the fed that year. And I took that crop to the stock. So that's my second foundation crop. So I had the OT crop, yeah. and then I had this white fly crop. And he, his mother was still a baby out of Mary Ann from, from Silas Willis. Mm -hmm. So, and I understood that was, that was tough. So you yeah, understand. So, so the mother was a white fly then, which is a Mary Ann, crossed then with the OT crop son, which bred the white fly. Crop. And so now I had two click bears in my, in my race. In the meantime, you know, I went to Sun City for one morning. So that's where I want to be. That's where I want to go from now. So, so from then, you got all these racing wild, yeah. but it's all local stuff. And then what made you decide to, first of all, spend, I mean, with a, a lot of money yeah. so on, on, on good birds, but was it worth it? And then, and then why did you go do, why did you go, why did you go about it that way? So, so me and Naomi went to go and watch the sunset with our And uh, Kevin and Billy. And, and you remember that that time it was a massive event. I mean, a lot of people, a lot of people actually bought their farm machine for that event specific, you know. And so all, everybody that was anybody was there. And we had a lot of international entrants from Germany and all over the, over the world. And I literally went and, and the very first auction, I attended, I saw this Japanese guy or Chinese guy buying everything. You know, that was the first the first exposure. And he would literally buy number one, number two, number three, number four, and it would go for him. And so the second year I arrived and, and I said to him, I mean, we were sitting at breakfast. It wasn't a wasn't a planned thing. We were sitting at breakfast and I said to him, I mean, I said to him, why did we buy the first ten? And she looked at me, she said, Why? I said, Because you know what? These pictures Okay, of the cream of the cream. Because I had a discussion with Zandi the one day, and, and Zandi opened my eyes to something. Zandi said to me, and, and bless his soul, he said to me, he said, Mark, no, I could I could be the birds to a certain extent. I can't over prepare them because if I over prepare them, I'm going to get 100 pigeons together on the final. If 100 land together, who's the winner? My race is over. I need two, gap, one, gap. So knowing that all the birds are underprepared, if I can say that, the cream has to come on to the top of the day. You know, that's the thing is, if I, if I, and I saw this, when you go to a top, top page, and you say to him, tell me your click there, he won't sell it to you. He'll sell you the brother of, or the sister of, do you understand? Yeah. And, and that was my problem with pigeon planting. You could never buy the best. But at Sun City, it's fair game. Whoever bids the highest takes, takes the bird. That's yeah. how simple it is. Yeah. So in 2007, literally at breakfast the morning before, I said to Naomi, let's buy the first Although, thing. Although even doing what you did, I mean, that's still a gamble. You make pigeons, it's a gamble. It's a massive gamble. Yeah, I found my bank manager and I said to her, listen, how much do I have in my bond? And she said, you put 1.2 million in your bond, you know, which I don't have. So that day I spent 1.150 from the bed. And I bought number one, number two, number three. Uh, number four was Dean Worcester's bird, which was local, so I thought, you know what, buy that. Let me buy number five, number six, and number seven. I bought. And then I bought lot 17. I can remember those are the ones I bought. So included in that was obviously Alphonse Klaus's Constantine. Oh, okay. Which I was a very famous bird in my yeah. life. Then Schalke four was second, Dr. Field the food was third, Lions Action was fifth, Zander, which became a very yeah. much top was six, yeah. and Supergirl, which ended up to be a boy, he was you know seven. Okay. So I, and then I bought a Lithuanian in which he was seventeen. And so now I bought these birds, and obviously there was already I mean the whole South Africa was talking about this market should make buying these birds and then it's not the money and it's bad and all these things. And I literally took them up, and um, and I, what I did is because one was a was a hen and two was a cock, I made them in, and three was a hen and four was a five was a cock, I made them in, and and obviously Zander, I made them to one of my lines because I hadn't had birdie at that stage, so I bought those and I made them. We're going to get to that. Yeah, that's a big part of the whole 
so, so now I buy these goods and um, I make them together. Now, remember something, you're buying them first week in February. Now, most people have fleeced breeding market around them. So I make them up and I bred them very late. Round. My wife would come sit with me outside mm. and, uh, you know, you get those babies. Because you buy in February, you're now breeding late, late breeds. And she would come outside and, and she, would, she would identify them and I'd say to her, Naomi, what do you see? Tell, show me what do you see. No, they look pretty. They look nice. Meanwhile, you know, she was picking them out, all my internationals. I just couldn't understand it. Mm. So the one day, Isaac calls me. He says, boss, come look here. Yes, and my birds are running over the loose. He says, no, don't look there. Look up. So I look up and I see these kids, corkscrew, corkscrew. So I says to him, get the strippers, let's get these other birds down. We get them down, we get them in the loft. And you will not believe me, Russell, those 40 that were training up there were the internationals. So they're just different. Whether it's the air sac development or whatever, they were just literally different. They could fly at an altitude that our birds couldn't. And I believe, historically, what's happened is the Janssens, all the birds that we brought in, you know, we kept them, we kept in, interbreeding, intertwining or whatever. And we started breeding birds that, are, that aren't at the standard. Although we're putting winner with winner, whatever. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a family I, 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 of birds. I hear, I hear what you say there, Mark, but, I, but I, I'm just going to throw a little bit of a spanner in the works there. So, and the only guy that's done it is you. If you, go, if you look at all the other guys, and I'm going to name them, and, and you'll agree with me, that they maintain the highest level with their old birds. So if I name Arnie Moray, hmm. uh, Acuricus, even a Tom Lock, uh, a Bill Kitchen Bread, you're dead. Yeah. Um, Kevin himself, um, Chris Smith. And I can go on, I can go on naming yeah. Andrew Small. I can go on naming guys that maintain the highest level of competition with local birds until you came along. Yeah, look. What I want to say to you, and, and, I, and I said, so I just want to ask you this question before you carry on. Do you think it was because you bought the top birds at that, at that Sun City million dollar? Or what do you, what do you think it was? So, so let me explain it to you this way. You know, when I was in Kempton, mm -hmm. there were 30 fancies in the club. All 30 of us are, are tossing like this, training like that, mm -hmm. eating like that, whatever. Mm -hmm. At the end of the year, there's still a champion. You understand? Yes. Because we're all doing the same. Yeah. We've got the same birds, we've got the same bloodline. Now somebody moves in and all of a sudden he's flying international birds, feeding differently, tossing differently, whatever. And now I win 18 races or 20 races and in the derby I take the first seven and what have you. Now everybody shakes and says, what now? You know, when I, when I moved to Alberton, and I'll never forget this because it's a fact, uh, you know, me and my wife went to the first AGM and one of the ladies said to my wife, you know, you were a big fish in a small dam. You're now a small fish in a big dam. Because which, this is Alberton. Which I wouldn't disagree with. Yeah. Because at that stage, and uh, as you all know, Alberton had the name of Little Belgium. Exactly. Because all top faces lived in Alberton. Yeah, and in, 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 in Alberton. So and my very first race I flew there, uh, I put seven in the 12 in the, in the very first race. And, and my wife subsequently walked in again in the club and said, yes, this little fish is swimming. You know, you know, no, she doesn't keep quiet. So the point is, if everybody's doing the same thing, there will still be a champion. Mm -hmm. But when somebody comes with disruptive engineering, if I can put it that way, mm -hmm. all of a sudden there's a new standard. And guys wake up, you know, and say, you know, I'll never forget what, what Hans Tenun said to me when I was flying in Kempton. He said to me, Mark, understand, we in Kempton. We're flying in the Fed, okay? We've never been in the top 30 in the Fed, and it's because of where we stay. You know, the birds come in the front, and they go around this mm -hmm. way, this way. Mm -hmm. You'll never... The second season I was there, I ended up sixth, and Hans ended up, I think, 10th or 12th. And so I said to my car, Hans, what now? Where's your argument now? Mm -hmm. So it's all about if you have the same standard. You know, you, you mentioned Kevin. Mm -hmm. Kevin's results have improved hugely. I mean, Kevin bought... 
a round of internationals from here, which he integrated into his family. I mean, you know, Billy, he bought cars, Kuri, he bought also a pretty much of the OCs, whatever you, and improved his game. And I think what happened was, after my results, a lot of guys went and re looked at the board and said, you know, I need to get internationals. Mark Erasmus is another example. He bought birds, international birds from me, and he integrated them into his loft. Mm -hmm. And I mean, that, that one, the, the second season in Whitfield, I think he won 10 or 13 races mm -hmm. out of the international. So, so all of a sudden, you get a guy that comes and he disrupts everything. And then everybody else says, Shit, what must I do? What must I do? You know, uh, this recipe that he's doing is working. And, and so everybody like lifted the game, or lifted the game. And, and we created a new, I think, a new breed of pigeon fans. Mm -hmm. I mean, you go and look up until today. What people are spending on buying pigeons on different websites and whatever. I mean, you say to yourself, you know, when are they going to stop buying? But they yeah. just keep on buying. Just keep on buying. And the prices keep on going up. I think that's the one thing that I changed. Yes, Roland had a huge auction in '98, and there was a lot of money involved, and there were other auctions. But I think from the time that I bought and I bought the most expensive birds, and I raised the pricing because when I bought Birdie, I said to myself, listen. You know, if you own a Ferrari, you don't want your neighbor also to have one, and the guy across the street also have one, and the guy down the block also one. So I said, boys, if you want to buy a birdie baby, you're going to pay under something. Finish it club. And you know what happened is, they bought them. So just, just, just go back a little bit before you bought water and why you bought her and okay so so the first year that, that was another year in yeah so, so, in our country so, so so the first year i obviously bought those first uh four seven yeah and and obviously i prayed with them and immediately i got results of them um then the second year obviously was birdie the year of birdie and, and this bird just flew away from yeah, everything and anything normal. i mean yeah. she literally landed in the hot spots she had landed three times with the winning bird. So she could have won three buckies. In the final, she ended up 10th. Yeah. And I want to say what a lot of people don't know, she only had eight flights. I mean, just think of that. And the, and, and the birdage there, because I hear yeah. a lot of guys comparing other one loft races to birds that might be as good as birdie. Yeah. The competition level that she was against and the birdage that she was flying against was you know, different level. I'm not, a, I'm not a journalist in pigeons or whatever, but some of the top journalists that I know mm -hmm. that have spoken about birdie said to me she had the highest coefficient of any bird, in any single bird loft at the time. Yeah. So she was just special. And, yeah. and when I looked at birdie and I said to myself, okay, what made her so special? I think the following. Number one is it's genetics. Number two, all birdie's children don't get sick. Now, if you think about Birdie, she performed from the first toss yeah. until the last race. She won the hot spot averages, she won the grand averages, she won everything. Okay, and if you look at her, she was she was always in the front. You know, I think the furthest she was out, except the last race, was was like five or six minutes from the first bird going over the track. And you know, in the beginning of the training, you know, two thousand birds arrived together, they turn and turn. But she was still keen to get into the loft. She had that keenness. So she obviously never got sick through the whole process to be able to perform like that. And I look at it and I say to myself, when I bred with her, her babies were so healthy and their babies were so healthy. You know, they in my loft, they never got sick. And I also realized that with the Alphonse classes. You know, the Alphonse classes, it's as if their immune system was higher or better. Yeah. You know, there are seven differences between the best pigeons in the world and the rest. Seven, and and this I was taught. Mm. Number one, the best birds in the world have got more feathers. Now, if you think of a bird, you think of a bird's tail that comes up. Go and have a look how thick the feather is. The feathers are of that bird. Mm. The back, we call it the back. back yeah. Birds got to have a solid back with one feather. Mm. You will see that that bird's actually got more feathers. Okay, and because they've got more feathers, they are more streamlined. In other words, they smoother. You, know, you handle, you, I mean, you've been to guys' lofts and you handle the bird and that bird's feathering is just in a different league. And, you, and, and then you ask the guy, so what do the bird do? Now it's a triple winner, a double winner, what have you. So, so the first difference is they've got more feathers and that's genetic. Secondly, the feathering is smoother. So they cut the air, it's got to do with aerodynamics. 
The third thing which I realized was, is that some birds, and you can think of your own dog, when they land after 10 hours and 12 hours, mm -hmm. within minutes, they fly to the perch, it looks like they've been nowhere. Mm -hmm. The next morning, they actually handle better. Okay? They recover quickly. And that's got to do with their genetic profile, with their chromosomes, with the protein levels within their body. They actually recover quicker. Their muscle structure recovers quicker. And that's genetics. Okay? And I look like a bird like Azeroth, you know, when I bred with her. Her babies, I'd literally, you know, they fly eight or nine or ten hours of the wing, land, and then they look like they've been nowhere. You know, the next morning you handle them, they, they blow, they're beautiful, and you just want to send them back. So that's the next one. The following, the fourth one, is that the best birds in the world have got bloated muscles. A lot of the old pigeons, the, the, the Janssens and those, have got what we call elongated muscles. Now, if you look at the best birds, if you had a birdie, and, and remember, I had the privilege, I had $5 million winners in my life, but I actually had $13 million birds in my life, because, you know, Shark 04 landed with Constantine. Mm -hmm. Jamie Action landed with the winner. And so, to me, she's a winner, you know. Uh, you know, um, uh, Hardy Kruger's bird was third, but three got to, came together. So, to, so, to me, one fine day. They, they're all winners. I 13 winners. And when you had all those birds the whole time, you realize, but hold on, the weight is towards the front. You know, there's, there's more muscle in the front. Do you understand? It's as if they, they're broader in the front. And, but and if, 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 I just general, stop, if I could just stop you there, Mark, because I've, I've, I've also been around, you know, I've been to yes. Germany and Belgium and Holland and, and I've handled a lot of birds and I've been to the top class, you yeah? know. And so I just want you to correct me if I'm wrong. The, 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 the more modern pigeon, especially now the new crazies, the kittles and the best kittles, they feel like you're saying now more bulkier towards the front. Correct. But do you think they're going to race as well as as our South African birds, our good South African birds, our top South African birds on the distance? Because these are, these birds are all um, classified as world class sprinters. Yes. So, okay, so, so, so I'm, just, I'm going to answer that question, but I just want to come back to the seven points okay. because, because we've now given five. Yeah. You know? yeah. The next one I added, okay, mm -hmm. I said to myself, the best birds in the world have got a different genetic profile and they don't get sick. In other words, the, 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 uh, the, uh, the immunity mm -hmm. is better. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. and, and you will know this from human beings. I mean, I watched a movie called Broken, mm -hmm. and it's a movie that I suggest everybody go and watch. It's Samuel L. Jackson and Bruce Willis. Samuel L. Jackson on the one side, Bruce Willis is on the other side. Samuel L. Jackson, when he walks outside, he falls, he breaks his leg, mm -hmm. he breaks his hip, and eventually he's in a wheelchair. So he goes and he does research to find out, is there somebody on the other side? And they find Bruce Willis, he was in a car accident, six people die, he lives. He, lives. Mm -hmm. he was in a train crash, 600 people die, he lives. Mm -hmm. And so he said, but there's somebody on the other side, you know, somebody else doesn't get sick and doesn't. And you, we see that in human beings. I mean, we have some people that are 70, 80 years old and they've yeah. never been to hospital. Yeah. The other person from the age of 13 has got cancer and whatever, and it's got to do with genetic profile. And I believe that the best birds in the world have got a better immune system. So they, come to they, don't get, yeah, they don't get sick. And that's where birdie is a great example. The seventh one is something that Alphonse Klaus taught me. And I rarely speak about it because mm. people don't necessarily understand it. And some people say, I'll talk shit. And that's fine. Mm. Alphonse Klaus said to me, the best birds in the world windsurf. They do this. They windsurf. Okay? And they don't burn the inside of their flights. Other birds that don't have their genetic build, they actually fly. Mm -hmm. Okay? So I've always said an average pigeon can win a short distance race, mm -hmm. but an average pigeon cannot win a middle and a long distance race. Okay? It's a better pigeon that's going to do that. Mm -hmm. Have a look at when you see the Wesley wind blowing in South Africa, how those birds wind surf. They will surf into the wind. Do you understand? And they use the wind less their wings and more their body. And so Alphonse Klaus said to me, when you look, when Alphonse comes to your house ever, let, give him your best pigeon, and you, what, what you'll do is he'll hold it, he'll handle it, whatever, and then he lets it go in a certain way, and he looks how the bird drops to the ground. Mm -hmm. Go and have a look at your best birds. They, they go from the ground to the top, 
it's one movement, it's like the effortless. Effortless. Now, he said to me, the center of gravity of the best birds are towards the front. So when they lay in the wing pocket, they lay at a different angle and they windsurf. Okay? And they take less pressure on the body as other birds. And that's the seventh dis uh, difference between the birds. Okay. Okay. That, that I have learned or, or, or that. And when you look, and that's why Naomi would say that bird looks different because they stand different. Yeah. They look like they're standing more upright than the other birds. I right. understand. Yeah. So those are the those are the seven differences that I've realized yeah. with time. So I've got five my five rules are the, the food. You know, and you know, I only fly with international food. And the reason for that is not because I'm windgat or this or that. You know what, eh? the Belgians, you don't talk to the guys in Belgium and Netherlands, whatever. These guys have analyzed food for a hundred years. They go, I mean, you look at Bayer. Bayer goes and buys the best maize in France. After that, natural buys. And then I think it's Matador and whatever. These guys go and buy the best maize. Then they go and buy, you know, the best sorghum. They buy the best of the best. They put it into a mix. And, and I mean, they've taken pigeons and put them in wheat tunnels. Then they feed them just maize. Then after they've flown, they actually cut them open. They cut the cells open. They look how much energy is still left in the bird and whatever. So over, over 100 years, they've identified short distance food, middle distance food, and long distance food. Yeah, in South Africa, what do we do? The guy runs to a farmer, gets some maize, and he goes and gets some maples, he hoists everything together, chop, he's a feed analyst. I'm saying, what are you doing? You know, I've always maintained, yes, some people say, you know, the international food's expensive, but realistically, I'd rather toss once less a week and give my birds proper food where they've got energy, what they require to do the job. Mm -hmm. A truck that's half full cannot reach Cape Town. As simple as that. Okay? And a pigeon that doesn't have the right energy levels cannot do the job consistently. So just getting on to that time, because you and I had a little bit of a discussion yesterday. I said I was going to ask you today. Um, because someone came in the shop and was asking about sunflower. And you said, look, tomorrow after my podcast, sunflower will be out of the question. So, yeah. So, so, so leave it for the leave it for the show. So let's so, so tell us about it. So one. so let's look at sunflower. I've never given sunflower, you know. Um, in the mix that I receive from Belgium, yes, there is a little bit of sunflower, but I don't but add don't sunflower. sunflower. I don't buy sunflower, and it's it's got nothing to do with me bad mouthing anybody. This is my opinion. No, 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 yeah, that's what I'm my opinion is the following: that <coughs> what is sunflower? Sunflower is fiber. The shell is fiber. Okay, and all pigeons need fiber, human beings need fiber, yeah. and then it's filled with oil. Yeah. And the oil gives them, you know, certain capabilities, okay, yeah. to burn energy. So if I want to give fiber, you know, I go and buy jungle oats. Because jungle oats doesn't just have fiber, it has energy as well. Okay, so that's the first point. The second point is, if I want to give them more oil, I give them a pigeon oil. That's made by a pigeon company. That's got the right balances in. And in my case, and I'm not saying other products are bad. I mean, at Farid's shop, and, 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 and thank God for Farid, because he does an, an excellent job. Mm -hmm. You know, he, he really is a, a very good person to the, to the sport. And like yourself, if you look at Vigo oil that, that, uh, that mm -hmm. uh, Pete von Salman, mm -hmm. you know, that oil has got all the oils in. It's got alconitine, carnitine, lecithine. It's got all of these products in that are made for a pigeon. Do you understand? And I've seen, if I give that oil to my birds, there's a difference with regards to the bird. So how would you give it and when would you give it on what? Um, so the, I don't give oil after Tuesday. I never give oil after Tuesday. But, and on what distances are you talking about? I'm talking about all distances. All I distances. give I give my oil on a Tuesday afternoon, I'll give them oil. And, and on hard races, mm -hmm. I will give them, if they return, I will give them that Sunday night, Saturday night, and obviously overnight Sunday morning. But after Tuesday, I don't give away. So, so with regards to sunflower, my problem with sunflower is, the, is that the fungi, mm -hmm. you know, one of the biggest problems in racing pigeons is, is fungi and, and, and sour crop and what have you. Mm -hmm. And you must understand, the crop is the engine. 
People think it's the wings and everything else. If the crop isn't healthy, the bird's not digesting the correct amount of food, do you understand, or yeah. the energy, you know, because there are problems in the crop. So, so the crop has to be healthy. The pH of the bird has to be healthy. Okay? And for that reason, I believe that fungus is a huge problem in pigeon racing. Now, the farmers out there, if you look how they farm, now as opposed to 30 or 40 years ago, they're not so much concerned about fungi on the midis and things, because why? The midis and the, and, 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 and the sunflower are sent to companies yeah. that, process that get, they process them at a very high temperature. So all the fungi and all of that's dead. They're making porridges and oils and, you know, sun, uh, oils for us to cook with and whatever. So they don't focus on fungus. For us, it's critical. Mm. Now, you can just have the wrong batch of sunflower, and I promise you now, you're gone. You will not fly with the top guys. You're gone. Now I'm saying, why do you want to take that risk? Okay, so now I just want to ask you another question on that, because a lot of the guys that I know that use uh, sunflower, including myself, we use it so we can feed them full and, and maintain their weight. Yes. Without weighing X amount of grams per day, and how, how would you control the so, weight then? So, if you look at a bird, a bird's got the, one of the shortest digestive tracks yeah. of any species. Okay? You can eat a steak tonight, tomorrow you can eat uh, pork, the next night you can eat chicken. But a pigeon, if you give him various foods the whole day long, you're actually giving him crabs. Okay? That's what I believe. Mm -hmm. And that's what I've been told in Belgium. Mm -hmm. So, because he's got such a short digestive tract, what I suggest is that you give him the same food every day, but just less on the shorts. A guy like Kevin flies on 14 grams in the morning, 14 at night. And do you know Kevin's tips you well, You know what, at the end of the day, <laughs> at the end of the day, he, 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 Kevin's going to cut the uh, you remember, Kevin, short Kevin is an icon yeah. in the sport, you know, and he's achieved a lot. But, you know, he gives 14 grams in the morning, 14 at night. I flew on 16 grams in the morning, 16 at night, and then obviously I give feed additives like oats and things okay. like that. So, you know, we all do our best, but the point is to go and change the feeding. You know, I hear guys say, on a Sunday I give barley, on a Monday I give sunflower, on a Tuesday I give this, on a Wednesday I give that, and I'm saying, why do you want to do that? Give well, them, in Belgium, give them they, quality food. In Belgium they give them the... the, the now what happens is Belgium, if you're going to look at their mixes, their short distance mix is a specific mix. You give it no, the no, whole no. week. Yes, but I, what I'm saying is they come, they come, when they land on a Saturday, they land on a, on a depurative, depurative mix. mix. Okay. So, so why do they land on the depurative? Uh, you've been there. The reality is when a bird is exercised, four, five, six, eight hundred k's or whatever it goes, when they get home, they don't want to eat. Generally, they don't want to eat. Um, they don't want to eat food. So what happens is, if you, if you look at it, it's because when they're flying, their brains actually swell. And when they land, they, they drink first, and then you see they sit a little bit off now, and then they start eating. Mm -hmm. And what you'll find is they'll eat fine food. Mm -hmm. Do you understand? They won't eat millies. They'll eat millies later. Do you understand? They eat the fine food or whatever. And so... Pigeons teach you, when you feed them, you, you also see in your own loft, when you're feeding your birds, you know, you get the guys that go and they throw the food in the bowl, they walk through, they throw it, and they just go, and they go out, and they go drink coffee. You know, I, when I feed my birds, I look, what are they eating? Mm -hmm. You know, are they eating just mealies? Are they eating the protein? What are they eating? Because then the bird tells you what it needs. Yeah. You understand? He's showing you. And so when birds get home from a long distance race, what you want to do is you immediately want to pick them up as quick as possible and bring them back to condition and form. Mm -hmm. And so I give them a depurative that's got a lot of energy. You know, white sorghum, those type of things have got a lot of energy. Mm -hmm. And they can digest it quickly because the circumference of the food is smaller. Mm -hmm. And so they digest and it. And any proteins then? You no. say to recover. So what I, you know, Russell, I, you know, when I was flying, I give them I give them a product number one and number two. I give number two when they arrive back. And basically what it is, it's a formulation of food where we've taken the molecules out and we've identified the actual food source. So while he's drinking, he's eating. Yeah. And so they recover quicker. And so that makes sense. Okay. Like if you go and watch comrades, when those guys finish a comrades, they all get given a, 
an Energate yeah. immediately. And they drink four or five Energates. They won't eat, he won't go and eat the hamburger, but he'll drink Energate, five or six of them, and then obviously gradually recover. So to me, you know, if you look at the depuratives, the guys will give depuratives when they ride back, but as soon as the bird is fully recovered, he gives them the mix, whatever the mix is for the week. So I, I like standardizing things. I don't like changing things in the loft. When I'm flying short distance, 16 grams. When I'm flying middle distance, I'll go up to 18 grams. And, and remember, we have the advantage, seven days before the time, we can see what the wind's right. going to do on Saturday. Yeah. And generally, the wind is right. So so I sort of get you right there. So when, you, when you're saying the grammage, the grammage, the grammage, the food structure doesn't change. Nothing changes. The food is exactly the same. Okay, okay but... I'm contradicting myself because what happens is on the short distance mm. I would fly on super sprint which is natural mm. you know and that's got more less maizing mm. it's got more finer foods and things like that, energy sources because okay. your birds want to you want to keep them as light as possible okay? okay then we move over to the middle distance which is then uh, sports maxi which has got a lot more maizing okay. but what I do is as I go from short to middle I will add 50% and 50%, you know, for like the first week, week and a half, and then eventually I'll just be on sport. Yeah. And then when you get to the long distance, mm -hmm. you'll see that in the in, in the mix from uh, from natural, there will be peanuts in, there will be uh, sunflower that's been, you know, yeah. just dehusked and what have you. And so again, I gradually go into the into the long distance food. Right? So that you can maintain because if you if you change suddenly the same week, the same day, then you'll see an effect on your words. Trust me, you'll see an effect. And then just going the the shorts, the middles, the long. Um, obviously so the food you've explained now, what about the training method now? So so from before the season, okay. So yeah. so that is where that is where I'm totally different to other guys. My, yeah, so. my babies and, and remember something, pigeon sport is expensive. Okay? And I've always said this, you get four different guys in a club. You get the Bolton and Brandy guy. So he eats his Bolton and he drinks his brandy and he talks about that one race that he won five years ago. Okay? And he's part of the club, and he's an integral part of the club. He loves his sport. Then you normally get the guys who are a little bit older, like my dad was. Mm. My dad, if he wants three races or four races a year, he's happy. He's not even thinking of the averages. Mm. Okay, he wants to fly. You know. Then you get the guys that are more competitive. They say, "Shit, I want to end up in the top three in in, in Benoni Club because it's a very strong club." You know, and for win a couple of races, and I'm in the top three. I'm now going to be in the top ten in the union. Then you get the guy that's a fanatic. And I class myself as one of those guys. Uh, a guy like Heislo, a guy like Kevin, fanatical, you know, John Field, these guys, ugly small. They want to win the averages, okay? And they'll do anything to, to win the averages. They are different people with different goals and dif different methods of flying pigeons. Mm -hmm. They are totally fanatical about the sport. And we need to understand that there's a budget involved. Now, you go and look at the top 10 in the Fed. I'll, I'll, I'll give you a challenge. I'll write down the top 10 in the Fed. This, I can write them now. And just like at the GRPF. And I can do that in the union as well. Because, unfortunately, a lot of people don't have the budget mm. to be able to do what I did. Okay? And what Kevin does. Yeah. Okay? So, my, my birds, before the first race, my babies have done 3,500 kilometers before the first race. From when, Mark? So I start tossing early. You know, when my birds are running an hour and a half, two hours, they need to run. Give us an idea of power factors. Well, like January, well, February, I'll give you an March, example. April. I'll give you an example and you can calculate. start it. racing in June. I, so I want to give an example and, 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 I'll, and I'll tell you what happened to me and why I learned this. Mm. So when I moved from Kempton to, to Alberton, um, I could only get the house in February. But I already brought, bred the babies in October of the following year. So what I did is I trained them at that house. They were running like you can't believe. So when I get to the new house, I let them out. And they flew immediately back to, to Kempton and I'll go fetch them, fly back and, and so on. And like I said to you, no, no, the first race I flew, I put seven in the 12 with broken in pigeons. And then I realized, but hold on, what about the feathering? Somebody told me you can't toss because they, they need to sit 
and they need to fit that, mm -hmm. you know. And I realized that's bullshit. That is conditioning again. Somebody has said, first of April we chase up, then we start tossing. And I changed that. And so the year of COVID is the best example I can give you because the year of COVID, we were all in the same boat. We couldn't toss our birds from 24th of March up until middle July. Okay? Nobody could toss. And then we could only start tossing and then we could start racing. Okay? So on the 23rd of March, the day before the lockdown, mm -hmm. my babies were at Tromsberg, 480 kilometers. The day before 23rd of March, that year, so that means you've been tossing that year. That year, we flew 30 races because we didn't fly for seasons season, again. Yeah. We, we flew 30 out of the 38. Now, in the history of the Fed, the guy that's most won the most Feds was Schmidt and Bauer with seven, seven victories or yeah. seven federations. Seven feds, yeah. But that was out of 38 races. I won 11 Feds out of 30 that year. And what does that tell you? So, I toss earlier. When my birds, a baby, should never be locked up. And when I say never locked up, you get a lot of guys that let their babies out to walk around and, and do all this yeah, shit. Yeah, yeah. I don't do that. But so mean, when those birds are training, when they're training, when I get them in there and they're training, they I get them in, I feed them, and they sit still. Tomorrow morning I chase them up, they go, they fly the hour, two hours, in, sit still. Then when so I stop tossing, right, right through the mop, mop. Right through the mop. The mop to me doesn't exist. Two bush doves are sitting in a tree. <coughs> so the one bush dove says to the other guy, hey, John, look at your ninth pin. Are you, you, are you, okay, you can't fly. Uh, I've actually thrown my eighth and my fourth, you know, so I'm not flying. So for seven days, they sit in the tree and then they die of hunger. Bush doves fly every day of their lives. They fly 70. They fly actually twice. They fly to the one and they feed. They fly back, then they fly to the other source and they feed and they come back. Now what about the malt? I'm not saying that birds that are malting, that you need to take them 300 kilometers in the worst part of the malt. I'm saying they need to exercise. And you know what happens is they actually become stronger. They become more powerful. Their muscle structure becomes more powerful. I'll never forget Kevin coming to my house and I tossed Tromsberg and we were talking at March. And, and when the birds came to land, you could see it like through the wings. Yeah. And Kevin said, you're killing your pigeons. I said, well, they are. Now I'm not killing them. You know? And you got to have a look at the long distance averages. Now, that theory of, of people saying, no, but you're going to burn your pigeons out. Mm -hmm. You know, hello. I mean, I won the long distance averages, I think, nine times. So if I burnt them out in the beginning of the season, how am I winning the long distance averages? Doesn't make sense. So, so that theory of of the mob doesn't exist in my world. Okay, and what I believe is, look, I do not toss November, December, and things like that. I believe that that's when they're training. They need to run in the heat because mm. that's predominantly our, our warm ups. Mm. They need to run in the heat, develop the air sacs and whatever, and then. When they do an hour and a half, I stop. And I start small. I mean, you've got time. You know, put them in the basket, 10 Ks, 15 Ks. And so you don't jump but No, I've got confidence. Yeah. When I get to Mayerton, mm -hmm. when I get to Mayerton, I've always done that. I give them four Mayertons, okay? And when I really see, I mean, you know, you look at the time that yeah, they spend yeah. on the road. When I see they're breaking and they're moving, what I've always done is I then go just in front of you, know, because my fear is always that somebody's training there mm. and the birds go into the back and then they train for two hours and then they're gone. So I go just in front of you and then I jump from there, 20 k's other side, uh, front of bow, because what I want is they must be running. Okay. If there's a kit, they must go over. They must join them, they must go over. Mm. And then I go, you know. And when I'm at my peak, when the birds are really, really being tossed, I will, for example, I'll toss... It's a, let's call it Monday. I'll toss Monday Fentersburg. Yeah. The next day I'll chase them up. The following day, 30 k's. The, the next day, one book. Chase up, 30 k's. Forget a flag. Chase up, 30 k's. Blue. Chase up, 30 k's. Tom's place. Chase up, 30 k's. Tromsburg. Chase up, 30 k's. Springfontein. That's all right. So, what's the furthest you go before the season? Springfontein. And that's to you? 510. 510. But what I do. As I've always said, I want to have seven, seven tosses 
race point and further before the first race. Okay, that's my method. And what I do is I make sure two of those tosses are tailwinds and five are headwinds. Okay, then I have a chart with all my babies. And initially I'll put my rings on. I mean, when they hit clone stuff, they yeah, know what they I'll put my rings on and then I'll clock them. And what I'll do is the first pack, I'll allocate on the board, I'll say one. Use the first pack one, a two for second pack, a three for third pack, and so on. Yeah. So what I do is after the seven races, I now sit and I say, okay, which 20 babies will go into the race? You know, I've got a baby that was seven times in front. Write his number down. Yet I've got a baby that was six times in front, once for second. Write his number. So by the time I send those 20 through the first race, I know exactly that I'm going to score. Mm -hmm. I'm going to have one. Because babies are unreliable. Yeah. Okay? Old birds, on the other hand, you know your old birds. Yeah, you can depend on And you prepare your old birds and you know they're going to come. And old birds, you've got a history. You know which ones are, were flying on the shorts, which were flying on the middles, and which flying on the long. Mm -hmm. So you can, you can identify them. Because if you want to win the Fed average or the Union average, you cannot miss. You've got to be in the top in the Fed when we were flying against Arnie and all of these guys. If you're not in the top 20 every week on average, you don't win the averages. So, so just on that, I understand your training in up to the to the to the first race, and then during the season, then what I do is they've now been to uh, they've been to Stromsburg. They've had seven hours on the wing of Stromsburg. They've had seven hours on the wing. And then on the week of, of preparation of the race, yeah. I will give them the Monday. I chase up on a Sunday. Yeah. Okay. And they, if they do half an hour, they do half an hour, whatever. I chase them up, I get them in. And that's another thing, I don't train twice a day. Never. I never ever chase them up in the afternoon. I don't do that. Because what I found is, because I'm building them the whole time, a lot of guys lose their race around the house. Mm. So it's both coming to form and condition. And what happens is, you chase them up at four. At six o'clock at night, you train tra trappers. That's your okay. week on. Yeah. So I train in the mornings, and I get them in, and they rest. So Sunday's chase up. Monday's morning will be a 30K. Tuesday, excuse me, Tuesday, I will give them an 80K. If it's a, if it's a, a, a headwind, 100K is if it's a tailwind. Wednesdays, I look, and I see what's the wind going to do. If I see it's a tailwind, I lock them up. If I see it's a headwind, I will toss them 30 k's. Thursday, 30 k's, go to the race. Both birds, birds that don't go to the race. Mm. Just remember something, I, I had a lot of birds, you know, so I had extra. Mm. I, would, I would toss them myself, and if I feel they need a Wittenberg, I will draft the Friday, because you've got an extra day right. for them to recover, or I'll draft a bloom, or whatever the case. I mean, I'm known, you know, me and Kevin, the ones, we tossed no port, to give you an example. Yeah. And I had one home on the day, and Kevin had two home on the day, to give you an example, because those birds hadn't had races. The following week, Kevin's one bird that was home on the day won the fed the following week. So just to give you an example, we are not scared to drive and to toss the birds. Bathing, I always bath on race day. Always on race day. Always. Obviously, in a neighbourhood or out. Or yeah. So, so in my case, in my case, I would I would take them out in the morning and toss them. I wouldn't feed them. Okay. So they'd come down, bath water, and they bath, and then I would get them in and feed them. Feed them. Okay. Uh, other guys that have the opportunity of a neighbour, it's much better because they can't strike up. Yeah. You know, because yeah. you could lose your race yeah. easily with a with, with a strike up. So I bath them on a, on. on on, on basketing day, if it's raining, I see it's going to rain now on Thursday, I'll bath them on the Wednesday. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You understand? Yeah, so you yeah. can just change up that. But I definitely bath them <coughs> once a week. And then I look at the pictures. What are they doing? A bird that gets in the bath and he's soaking wet, you can leave him at home. That cock that gets in the bath and baths, and when he gets out, it looks like he's bone dry. That's the bird that's on formal condition. Okay. And then, so we've got basically all of that now. Now, a lot of guys are going to want to know, and obviously, some of it's your secret, some of it's not, but the medication. Okay, so, so to me, I have and I know like you've spoken, said, sorry, yeah, you've spoken about birds with immunity and all of that, but we all know that we basket birds with not so healthy birds, yes. and 
be putting them under a hell of a stress and strain and so what do so you So I think so so the rising loft starts in the stock loft. Yeah. If you're breeding unhealthy babies, Schmidt said to me, if you breed a baby that has a throat like that, mm. he's not gonna become a racer. Yeah. You understand? If you yeah. breed you're breeding a breeding problem in him. Yeah. So to me, the stock loft is the start point. And this is where a lot of guys drop the ball because what they'll do is they, they finish racing and now we rest for two or three months, we breed babies and what have you, and then those have to be our champions next year. Yeah. So what I do in my, in my stock loft, let's start there. Mm -hmm. Firstly, I don't believe the stock bird should get any mates. For what? He needs protein. Mm -hmm. Okay. He's feeding his babies, they need protein. You want to develop muscles. So I've always given my stock birds young bird mix and a proper young bird mix, you know. Mm -hmm. I don't like a lot of red uh, sorghum in. I don't like a lot of that. I don't like uh, uh, barley, uh, barley and I do not like uh, uh, bird quorum, what's that in, in English? Sweet. Sweet. The reason for that is, and, and something that I was taught, that pigeons battle to break down wheat and they battle to break down barley. That's why birds lose weight with barley. Okay. And the other reason why I don't like barley is that a lot of times they've got those sharp edges. Yes. And when the bird's eating it actually scratches yes. the throat and yes. that's where your, your outbreaks come from. Yeah. So I don't feed them. So I give them a young bird mix, number one. Number two, in my race, in my stock loft, I always make sure that there's black crit and a variance of red crit and whatever for them to eat. Mm. And I make sure that they have a little holder of salt. Birds need salt, trust me, they will eat salt. A bird will not eat what it doesn't need. Good pigeons eat what they need. Okay, so I'll get some salt, so that's that. So is that the 24-7? 24-7, it's got to be in the loft. Okay. okay. Especially the black bird, because they eat, they need the black bird. Then, when it comes to uh, a process in my, in, my, in my stock loft, I have, what I do is on a, on a Monday, I will give them black magic, which is on a pit from sales product, but it's actually heavy boost, mm. okay? Which I will which I will thin out and give to them because it's too strong the way if you buy it pure. I'll give them twice a week, I'll give them that. Now that's for the immune system. It boosts the immune system. Okay. I believe the best product in the world, and I, and I say this with all due respect to all of the guys that have made medication, is, is a product called Belgazol, which comes from Inc. de Viet. Now it's not always readily available, but if you can get Belgazol and you can afford it, it is an unbelievable product. Some of the other guys give every stress, I think it's Uncle Roland, every product, dress, every every dress. dress. Yeah. That's, that's a very similar product. Mm. I give that every Wednesday of the last. And I don't give it in the water, I give it on the food, okay. because it's expensive. Yeah. And the reason why I did that, I had the privilege of flying with Henk de Viet. He invited me, I flew to Belgium, and we flew to, to China for 14 days. And so I was with Hank every single day. And when we got to the Langfang show, he had imported 12 containers of Belgazol. Or Belgazol, I don't know how you pronounce it. But I'm telling you now, the Saturday morning we were sold out. The guys come and they take 10 boxes. And I said to him, what is going on here? He said, Mark, birds use trace elements during processing their food. Okay. What are we doing? We're capturing our stock birds in, in a loft, one meter by one meter, single pin. That's where they are. They, they can't forage like other birds would do. And remember, where do pigeons come from? Pigeons actually come out of Asia. You know, we have this misperception that pigeons come out of Belgium. It's not true. If you go and look at the Qing dynasty, 600 years ago, they were flying pigeons. Okay. They, I mean, it's actually older than martial arts. Now, you will know geographically you have different trace elements in the ground. In China, their trace elements are different. And Hank identified a trace element that racing pigeons need or pigeons need in the raising of babies. Okay? So what happens now is just think, you can tell me if I'm wrong. Eggs are laid. I make sure that my birds get enough calcium because the egg, the hen needs the calcium. Okay? She lays the egg, baby comes out, the cock and the hen feeds, lacquer, lacquer, lacquer. Yeah, by day seven, day eight, what's happening? 
The hen is preparing to lay a game. Who's feeding? The cock is feeding mostly. Now at that point, he goes from soft crop to hard crop. And what you'll find, 90% of pigeons and that fancies can tell me if, they, if I'm wrong. You all of a sudden see a lot of moisture around your nest. A lot of water. Why? The cock is feeding water. He's feeding these whole millies and water. Why? Because he doesn't have this trace element that you find in Belgazon. And that trace element helps them to go from soft crop to hard crop. I promise you now, you give that stuff, you can shoot those the droppings. Okay? So I learned that from Hank. He said to me, Mark, never compensate when it comes to Belgazon. Never. Because that trace element is only in my product. And he will never tell anybody what it is. What it is yeah. He makes burgers on and he sells it like you've got cake. I mean, he, I've been to all of the top fanciers in Europe. All of them. And when you open them, and I, I get, I, you know, I'm an arrogant guy, because I'm not flying against Lodi Kruger. I open his cupboard. You know, when I was there with uh, Cook on the whole day, I opened his cupboard. I walked with him and he was feeding his birds cheese and things like that. Look, what are they doing? You know, what are, why are you there? You're there to learn. Mm. I'm not his competition because I bought a lot of pigeons from Alphonse class. Mm. You know, tell me what he's doing. Mm. And all of them, all of them use burgers on. Yeah. At least once a week in the stock loft. And I also use it, obviously, in the rice loft once a week. And so that is something that I do. So I give them pigeon tea, obviously, for their blood, blood circulation, what have you. I will make sure that I give a little bit of Epsom salts mm. in the stock loft, you know. And I will give them the black magic and I will feed them young bird mix. And you will find your babies are healthier. What I also do, and I've learned this, is when the babies are standing nice and you know where they get like bent up, they start mm. eating mm. you or whatever, I give them their first vaccine, dead vaccine. Okay. When I wean them, I give them another vaccine. And then every month thereafter, I vaccinate them. So I was ask, asking you earlier about that, if you can just explain why. So, because I said to you, You've only been vaccinated once in your life. Correct, for polio or whatever polio. the case. And, okay. So why vaccinate but I mean, them? You know, we as human beings, when, 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 you're, when you're not feeling lucky, you go for a big tall shot or mm. whatever. Mm. A pigeon can't talk to you. Mm. Okay? He can't tell you what's happening with him. You have to think for him. You know, a pigeon sits there and he doesn't know he's going to do 800 kilometers this weekend. You've got to make sure he eats enough. Mm. And you've got to think about a way of getting him to eat enough. Mm. Okay? And so when it comes to vaccines, because it's a dead vaccine, okay, you cannot vaccinate a pigeon too many times. You cannot do it. And every time you vaccinate him, you are stimulating him, his antibodies, okay, to actually react. And when that happens, their blood circulation, everything improves. They actually feel better. Do you understand? They feel better. So, so when would you vaccinate him if it's in the racism? On the Thursday of basketing on the so what I do is I vaccinate I vaccinate up until end of April I vaccinate okay okay and then I will uh, ten days before the race I'll vaccinate again and then I'll vaccinate the week of the derby and and because we we basket Thursday nights mm. the birds that are at home I will I will vaccinate them that Thursday night okay. and the others are basketed for the race yeah. and when the race birds arrive back on the sun on the Saturday I will vaccinate them. For the dog, your voice done. Okay. So vaccines, I believe, play a very important part. I think I once I told you that a pigeon is a blood vessel. So blood in a pigeon is actually an organ. You've got a heart and a lung and a kidney and whatever, those are your organs. But blood in a pigeon is an organ. That's why you'll find a pigeon hitting a wire and we'll sew him up. Mm. And within seven, seven to 14 days, the actual wound falls out. Mm -hmm. You know, you'll see these birds dragging because you obviously there's still a piece of gut or whatever in, and you'll see dragging the wound and he'll actually regenerate. Okay, none of the species that I know of does that. It might be, might be wrong, but it's one of the uniqueness of a pigeon is the blood, and that's why blood is so important in a pigeon. That's why you know, keeping the blood pure mm -hmm. and oxygenated is so important in a racing pigeon, mm -hmm. uh, and so for that reason. You've got to look at a pigeon and say, this is how you're treating or that's what you're doing with your pigeon. This is because it's a blood, it's an organ. Do you understand? But now getting back to that, that so now you've done the stock loft and you've explained that, but now the medication during the Okay, so I just want to finish with the with the blood. Yeah. So so 
a pigeon can only carry one virus at a time. Yeah, she's mentioned that to me. Okay, so not like you, you can carry a couple of viruses. Mm -hmm. And again, I'm not a scientist. This is what I've been told. Mm -hmm. You know, at one stage, a lot of guys say to me, Mark, but you know, you, you talk what you don't know. And I say, yeah. okay, that's fine. You know, I flew in to Viet Inc. from Belgium and I took Pete from Seoul mm -hmm. and we went to the Thorny Bush collection for 10 days where I was sitting across the two best beds I believe in the world. And if you think I didn't listen and ask questions, to those two gentlemen, when I had the time, mm. you know, we'd go for a game drive in the morning, and then what then? Then we were talking pigeons, mm. what to feed, when to feed, how to feed, what do you give, what works, what doesn't work, combinations, whatever. So I've learned a lot. And I can say to you emphatically, a pigeon can only have one virus. So if you are 10 days before the first race, if you're giving him, inducing a virus, for the first six weeks of the, of the racing season, he's got immunity. And so you won't pick up young bird mix, uh, young bird sickness and all of these other things. I'd like to get to the point where every single pigeon fancy knows what I know. Because if we all 30 of us know how to keep our birds healthy, the champion will still be the champion. Yeah. The guy that works the hardest, the guy that's got the best genetics, the spirits, yeah. will still win. And that's what people forget, you know. that They try and keep the other people in the dark that they don't know. You know what happens? That guy ends up stopping pigeons. He stops racing because he's getting whacked every single weekend. You can't win all the races. You need to understand that it's important that the Bolton and Brandy guy wins one race. Mm. Do you understand? And, and so that's my belief is that we need to make the sport easier. Okay, so, Russell, so basically the stock loft. Mm. We've now dealt with. Yeah. We, our birds are healthy. The stock are healthy. Um, I, I, obviously, before I start breeding, breeding them, I will obviously do worm the stock birds. Yeah. I will put them on on a coxy program. So for basic treatment. Yeah, yeah, just mm -hmm. to get them healthy. Yeah. A little bit of canker, whatever you. Make sure they're healthy. Look at their throats. Make sure their breathing is okay before I start breeding. So those are things that I think we all do. Okay. When I wean my baby, and this is critical. What people don't understand, when you wean a baby, and, and Pete van Sal taught me this, in, the, in nature, the birds are obviously in the trees or what have you, and they have the same problems that what we typically would have in our racing lots. But in our racing lots, it's more critical because we want to fly birds at their oh, at the, at the peak. Oh, okay. okay. When you wean a baby, every single loft in the world is got coxie. You can tell me what you want to, we've just got different levels. We call it flora. Mm -hmm. And there's coxie in the loft. So what babies are prone to do is they pick up coxie in the race loft. Now what they do is to defend themselves, they thicken, they thicken their crop lining, okay, to defend themselves. That's how it works in nature. Now, for a bush dove, the fact that he's thickened his crop lining isn't a problem. For a racing pigeon, if he's carrying an extra 10 grams over 800 kilometers, it's an issue. And as soon as he thickens his crop lining, his ability to actually digest the food is reduced. So the thinner your crop lining, the more, if you're feeding 16 grams, the one bird's going to get 80% of the nutrients, the other bird's only going to get 50% of the so nutrients. I just want to ask you something there. When you say thickens the crop lining, does he retain that for the rest of his for life? For the rest of his life. And it's a, it's a defense mechanism. Okay. okay. So what happens is, <coughs> If your bird is carrying an extra 10 or 15 grams and my bird isn't carrying it, my bird can also... Now, have you ever seen pigeons that some pigeons are like all over the nest? They, they, they want to eat, you know, they can't eat enough. You can't feed them enough. And when you feed them, their crops are like this. Where the best pigeons, you'll see, eat less. It is, uh, I think so. it is a lesson that we need to learn. Nature is telling us something. Yeah. Okay. And what's nature telling us? Nature is telling us that some birds cannot get enough food. They don't digest the nutrients that they should. So what I do is when I win my babies, 14 days, they're on a coxie product. Whether that be sulfazine or pit von has got a very good co coxie pro uh, product, uh, coxie cure, whatever that product is, I put them on for 10 days. Because remember, when he's with mommy, mommy is giving him her probiotics and everything, her immunity. Mm -hmm. When you wean him for about 60 days, he has no immunity. Okay? He's open. 
And that's when they pick sicknesses up. And that's when we start developing birds, getting sick and dying. You hear of these guys saying, yes, I've lost 40 babies and I've lost 50 babies. Yeah. It's a combination of, number one, paramyxovirus, and number two, uh, coxie, which, is the, which then goes into other stuff. It develops into young bird sickness or whatever the case. Okay. So those two things to me are critical. Something I'd like to teach the pigeon fanciers and and when I was down in Cape Town, we, we, I went down for the, the, the Sapu mm -hmm. meeting and there were a lot of Cape, Cape Townians there and, and we had Oki talking as a guest mm -hmm. at, the, at the thing. And you were talking he's going to be on the show. And we, we show as well. oh, okay, well, yeah. in any case, we were talking about, we were talking about young bird sickness. Now, young mm -hmm. bird sickness hits all of us, or generally all of us. Now, if I say to you, in the last 15 years, I've never ever had young bird sickness. It's a fact. I've never had it. I've had people phone me to say, I've got young bird, what do I do? But me personally, I don't have it. And because I believe prevention is better than cure. If you're doing the right thing in the stock loft and you're vaccinating your birds every month, you're going to pick up less ailments in your, in your race loft. Mm -hmm. If you're doing the coxie treatment in the beginning, you're going to pick up less ailments. But if you do get young bird sickness, the best thing for young with sickness is fine food. Mm. You immediately change them to fine food so that they don't sit with mealies and things yeah. like that in the crop. And I'm sure you've heard that. And then to give them amoxicillin, amoxicillin product, whatever that product be. And, and orchids got products, you know, pitch got products, whatever. Amoxicillin is something that the young bird sickness, within three days, it will go over. You know, but then what I do is I throw it on the food. I give them the young bird food and I put bergazole in the water because then I want to boost the immunity. Mm -hmm. I black magic on the food together with it to, to actually boost the immunity and pick them up. Now, I've had a guy that was leading the union averages that phoned me the Sunday night to say, Mark, my birds are coaching like you don't understand. What do I do? Do I sit out? Do I not fly? Do I whatever? And I said to him, I said, listen, go and get yourself a moxima, put it on the food, Go into fine food. Don't toss your birds. Okay, they're already fit. Don't toss them. Leave them in the loft. Give them the amoxicillin. Put uh, every dress or whatever in the water to help them, and wait for two to three days. And you will see they'll get over it. By Wednesday they should be able to give them a short toss. Thursday a short toss, and the birds you would have sent, send them. Mm -hmm. And that following weekend he actually won. He got second union on the one side, and he phoned me. So just, you're a genius. I said, no, I'm not a genius. It is just what is needed mm. for young bird sickness. Amoxicillin is the best product that you can give. Okay. And I mean, you can go to your pharmacist. There are products that are made for yeah. children with amoxicillin yeah. or whatever. Yeah. I'm not going to say you will use this or that. You might have something in your cupboard already. Yeah. So that's important. So, so yes, I then go into my racing program. My racing program, what I do is my race birds, if the very last race is, let's say, the 1st of October. Mm -hmm. I think this year they end up in September. September yeah. From that moment, I split my ends and cocks. My whole birds. Ends one side, cocks other side. Okay, I leave them. Then what I do is, I put them on young bird mix. I do not give any maize ever to my race birds during the off season. I put them on young bird mix right in the game. I don't like the, uh, a lot of red sorghum, I don't like the, the wheat, and I do not have barley in there. I give them young bird mix. I feed them twice a day, because remember, they're going through a malt. Now, I'll never forget when I bought birdie. Xander I bought the year before. And so the next day when I bought birdie, I was very fortunate to have Mark de Kork at my house, Eric Lundberg at my house, Harald Kuchmans at my house, Alphonse Klaus, Hans Paul Esser, I mean, the who's who, Henk, Jürgens, they were all at my house. Mm -hmm. And so, Afon said to me, so who are you going to pair up with Birdie? So I said, look, you know what, she's just raced. I mean, but, I don't, she's had a hard season, whatever, I'm going to let her rest a little bit, and then I'm going to pair her. And he looked at me and said, are you mad? She's in the form of her life. Why wouldn't you breed with her now? So I said, okay, good point. Then I said to him, but I mean, my cocks, they're falling apart. I mean, it's February, mm -hmm. okay? Uh... They first asked me, who are you going to mate him to? So I said, Zander, because I think he's an unbelievable pigeon. Okay? And Hans Paul Esser bred Zander. 
So, and, and Zander's nest, mate, by the way, in Belgium, had won a national. The actual nest, mate. So, I said, I put Zander with him. So, Wolfon said, fuck, that's perfect. It's exactly the right cock. So, I said, well, I'm going to have to wait because he's marking. So, Wolfon said, he said, are you crazy? I said, why? Well, he said, he's in the form of his life. He wouldn't be pushing pins. When they're pushing pins, their blood circulation is perfect. Mate, the but, but that goes for cocks, not for hens, though. Well, for but for anything, they so said. They, they, they said I to me. I'm me on this because uh, what I've heard and and guys, why guys don't make those hens when they are throwing all those pins and and coils and all of that is because they they're not going to put all the goodness into the eggs. They're going to put some of the goodness back into the new feather. Remember, it's all about feed allergies. And feeding your birds and giving them what they need. Sure, sure. If you're giving those birds calcium and you're doing what you need to do in the stock loft, mm. it's not going to make a difference. Now, okay. the very first baby I bred mm. out of birdie, and a lot of people say, what was birdie's success rate? Well, I can tell you, the first year I sold six babies. First tell us what she went for because yeah, I, there's, okay, there's so a lot of rumors going around it. So I can't even tell you, but I know she was the most expensive bird in the country at this stage. So at that point, at that point, the most expensive bird in the world was three hundred thousand. Okay, rand, rand. yeah, rand, three hundred thousand rand. I'm talking single bird lot. Yes, 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 yes. So she was the most expensive because I paid eight hundred thousand for her, and a lot of people said to me, "But Mark, you know, you're mad." I mean, on the day, I'll never forget it. The Afrikaans guys came and shook my hand and hugged me and bear hugged me and everything. Congratulations, the English guys. Didn't want to know anything about me, you know. Whether it was jealousy or whatever, I don't know. But I bought Birdie. I mean, my dad actually pulled my sleeve a couple of times and said, Marky, you can buy my whole loft for that and my house, you know. <laughs> and I think differently, okay. I learned, a, I learned a lesson from Lolly Jackson. And we all know who he, he was. Well, okay? I want to know those lessons. Yeah, but <laughs> Lolly, Lolly said the following. Yeah. He was he was interviewed on Card Blanche. Yeah. And what actually happened is he got on Van Buren Drive. Just trust I think he was blocking yes, and, uh, <laughs> and, 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 and he sees and he sees him setting up a trap. So he goes past, he phones his uh, attorney and he says, Listen, what's the worst that can happen to me if I go over this trap at a good of a speed? Mm-hmm. Now remember those years you weren't allowed to publish. Anything sexually, you weren't allowed to publish. It wasn't allowed in the newspapers and this and that or whatever. So the attorney says to him, listen, based on what I can understand, a 50,000 and fine or six months imprisonment. Mm. So Lolly gets in his car, 303 kilometers over the track. He was in every single newspaper, he was in every single magazine. And in fact, he, he, in fact he was interviewed on carte blanche. Okay, and afterwards he said he got five million rands publicity for fifty thousand rand. What a bargain! Now, the day I bought Birdie, I said to my wife, "I cannot pay enough for her." I actually budgeted one point two million for her that day. I phoned my bank manager and said, "What have we got?" One point two, and I said to him, "The more we pay." The better because the whole world will know who I am, the whole world will know his kitchen that lots. Mm-hmm. So it's a different way of thinking. Mm-hmm. And that's why I also charged more for the babies because I wanted them to be unique and special. I mean, how stupid was I? I mean, I bought Booty, I put it in my car, and I was driving back from Sun City to Alberton. While driving back, I got six phone calls and I sold six babies at 100,000 apiece. So I'd spent 800. But I got 600,000 just on the, in one day. The very first baby, those six babies I bred, I want to tell you, all six of them bred winners in their very first year. I think one of the most famous babies is Tiger. Tiger was sold to Hendrik Kotze in Cape Town, and he subsequently took genetics from, from uh, Birdie and uh, Alphonse Klaus, and he mixed them, and he sent them to the million dollar. And he actually won the SA Challenge four times, sure. which I think is $20,000 if I'm correct. Um, I spoke to him one day, he out of, out of he spent 100000 he made $1.6 million out of Tiger. And then he still sold Tiger as a 10-year-old for 100000 So he never lost. And in my case, I bought Birdie for 800000 I sold her in 2015, which is you know seven years of, of breeding. Mm. Eight years of breeding, and I sold it for 1.1 million. So how stupid was I? 
Do you understand? Mm-hmm. I just thought differently to other guys. Mm-hmm. People said I'm an idiot, but I'm saying I've got the best pigeon that's ever flown in a single bird loft in the world. I bring that genetics together. Now, going back to San City, I continued buying the winners. I bought Ali, he was the winner. I bought Regular, she was the winner. I bought Victor, my own winner, in a million dollar race. Mm. So, and then all the birds were second and third and whatever. So, in my world, I had 13 million dollar winners. And I would literally make them together. And if you go and look at what Mike Gannis has done, okay, he basically took my model and he continued with it. You know, and I'm sure he's, he's a man of integrity. He'll say it. that's where he lived because he has gone subsequently and he's put all of the million dollar winners and he makes them together and he gets his price for his birds and they're now performing all over the world. He's won, he's won big falls. And, and you're going to look at the lineage, you will see it's million dollar winners and, and single bird lot winners yeah. that are in those pedigrees. So I believe that the cream of the crop goes to the top and I bought that genetics and then my real success came when I took the O3 line, which was now breeding winners, mm. and I then crossed it with my internationals. So with Birdie, or with Constantine, or with, you know, those lines, Dr. Field, or whatever. I take them back to the race lot, they win, I bring them back to the O3 line. So, at worst, the in the race loft, 50% international, 50% local. Next time, they come back, 75% again. Local, 25% international. And if you do that, that's what Alphonse Klaus taught me. If you do that, you can never inbreed. You can't inbreed. It's impossible. Okay. Because so that, that, that's, that's all fine. But then the, 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 the basic medication throughout the, so, throughout the race. So what I did is when I, when I was with Hink de Viet and, 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 and Dr. Piet von Saal, I learned a lot about combinations of, of medication that you can put together. Okay. And what happened to me is, you know, I won 2008, I won the, the, the fair averages, 2009 Schmidt, I was second, 2010 I won, he was second, 2011 he won, I was second, uh, the following year he won, so we won it for six years, you know, either me or him. And then I moved my lofts, uh, I moved my lofts from 5 Opel Mine to my new house, yeah. and I subsequently put the loft on this side of the house, and I won the averages, I think 2012 there. And then, because of that white flat cock, mm. not wanting to trap, you know, trapping mm. differently, I decided to move my loft onto my pigeon, uh, onto my tennis court. Yes. And I built a new loft. And actually, a week before the time, I had nets, soccer nets up, homing the pigeons. And you can't believe it, I moved the birds from this side of the house to the other, and I actually lost old birds. I lost 10 old birds by doing that. Yeah. That's how full of shit they are. Yeah. But in any case, so that was my worst season. That I think I ended up 17th in the Fed that specific year. Mm-hmm. The following year, I was, I think, second. Okay? And my success, I believe, with regards to the changes I made, was because there was more ventilation. Roland Bauer, if you look at the lofts that he designed, they were all pitched roofs. Now, remember in Belgium, what people forget in Belgium, you know, a lot of guys say, but they don't have flat roofs in Belgium. So yeah, because they have snow. And snow on a flat roof is gonna come. You have to have a pitched roof, otherwise it's gonna break. So I mean the first time I won the fair averages was with a flat roof. You know, and I actually won it twice with a flat roof. So, you know, it's got to do with ventilation in your loft, it's got to do about air. And by pitching your roof, you're creating a better draft and a lot more air. You know, before pigeons I had quiz. I had, you know, beautiful koi's and one thing I read, uh, learned about koi's was you need quality food and you need a lot of oxygen. Mm-hmm. So the more oxygen you have and the better the food is, the bigger the fish grow. And so I, apply, I applied the same theory with regards to the race loft. So my race loft eventually, the one that's now on the internet that you can see, yeah. had a huge pitch roof yeah. and had a lot of volume. Harald Koopman taught me, I was sitting with him, and he said to me, Mark, let me tell you something. He said, with pigeons and with human beings, if you take a human being that works outside and he puts signboards up all year, you won't get a call. Okay? But take that same guy and put him in an air-conditioned room. Within a week, he's sick. And vice versa. Okay? And I learned that. I said to myself, what is he saying to me? And then he said to me, a bird needs to sit outside. 
but be inside. Mm. So what does that mean? A lot of oxygen, no wind. Or draft. You cannot have a draft. draft yeah. If you've got a draft in your loft, you're dead in the water. Yeah. So my loft, you know, was actually, if you look at the loft, there was gaps. I mean, my floors, I drilled holes mm. in my floors so I could get air from the bottom, but there was no draft. Mm. You know, I had blinds that I used to drop. If the wind picks up, I drop the blinds so that there's no wind on the pigeons. Mm. And I turned my perches to the sides so that the birds sit on the sides. They don't sit at the back. Mm. They actually sit on the sides. So they don't get a draft on them. Mm. Okay? And so that is critical in a race loft and in your race loft design is to get a design that you have a nice wind. You know, a lot of the old people used to walk into your loft and take a smoke and they blow and they check where's the smoker, you know. What I also learned with my race loft is that you, let's talk about three meters as, as an example. Mm -hmm. So let's say my, my birds are sitting in the two meter area where I've got a door. Then you've got a meter which is the passage. Mm -hmm. the, the roof pitch needs to be above the pa passage. Do you understand? So the short side which comes down will yeah. be on the front and the long side will be to the back and it must go over. There must be a gap at the back yeah. and a gap in the front to allow for oxygen. Mm. Okay, you don't want wind on your pigeons. Yeah. So that, that is absolutely critical. Okay. So, weaning my bird, seven days on, on seven to ten days on coxie. on coxie. Okay, and then obviously I let them out. Mm. And I would generally put a bath out because I believe once the bird is bathed, he feels at home. Mm -hmm. Then they, you'll see at a stage you get a little bit of windgat and they fly onto the roofs mm -hmm. and they fly down and fly up and after about three or four days of that, then I chase them. Are you chase them? I chase them. I throw a pillow or whatever, a red pillow or whatever, and you see them scatter. And from that point, they never come down. Never. So they either train or they end. They train or they end. Clear. And when they start running two hours, three hours, they tell you, then you can go to the road. Mm. And you do 10 k's, 15 k's. And remember something, a lot of guys don't understand. When you put the birds in the basket for the first time, mm. they scared. Yeah. You know, they don't know it. Yeah. So I know of very famous pigeons in Belgium that would actually basket them. I mean, Billy from Beast, mm. my loft manager in Belgium, did it. He actually takes the basket, and there we were on a farm, and he stands 50 meters away from the from the loft, and he opens, you know, he sit, lets him sit for an hour, then he opens, and then they fly back to the loft, you know, and he did that twice. Mm. And then he would start tossing, you know, from a logical point of view. Yeah, it's confidence. Yeah, them. it's just, to, and, and also it's the same thing with, with water, you know, birds don't drink water in the truck because they're not used to it. So you could typically have a union basket or a fed basket type of scenario. Well, you put your babies and you throw water in the trough just to teach them mm. to drink, you know. That is something that I think is important. Mm. Um, so, yeah, those are, you know, I always say racing pigeons, the difference between winning the average and being second, a lot of guys say it's 1%, I say it's 10%. Between second and third is another 10%. Between 10th and first is 100% mm. that you have to improve, okay. That's how big the gap is between winning the fed averages. Mm and being second. You know, it is the small things that you do in your loft that actually makes a huge difference to your birds. And remember, I give them young bird mix from November, from uh, October until, up until a month before the first race. Okay. That's all they eat. Then what I do is I have my race mix for the shorts. So week four, I will add 25% of the race mix, 75% young birds. Week three, 50 50. As you mean. Week two, yeah. 75 25. Week of the race on the, on, on the mix. Because I don't want to affect their gut lining yeah. and I don't want to affect yeah. the birds. And, then, and, and when you're tossing as hard as what I toss, they need that protein. Mm -hmm. And again, I land them on the, on the young birds, oh, okay. on the fine food. I land them on the fine food. Mm -hmm. Sundays to me is always Travis on a tea. They get trammels on the team. Sunday afternoons, I always give them something for malaria because malaria is a factor in, in, in racing pigeons. And then what I do is I go into my medication. And I've said to you, I learned about combinations. And what happened is in 2017, Opa At, which was like a father to me, you know, Tani Lena was 78, he was 82, 
And, and what happened is, now I'm telling Tani Elena, Tani Elena, you must give this in the morning, this in the afternoon, this at night. And, and then she'd be totally confused. So the one Sunday I was sitting in my pigeon uh, area, and I thought to myself, you know, I can't do this, because she phones me for five minutes, okay? Because Obaat is, you know, yeah. yeah. So I actually took nine products, and I worked out what I believed was correct, and I took the nine products, and I mixed them, you know? Uh, the, old, the old Joe Stratum way, you know, mix it in his kitchen mm. type of thing. So I mixed this combination and I walked into the house and my wife was busy making Sunday lunch. Mm. And I asked her for a holder and there was a custard holder, mm. you know, the plastic holder, a custard that was empty. So I grabbed it and I threw this powder, powder and the powder is generally yellow. I threw the powder in there and I closed it. And that Sunday afternoon we went to visit our part and I said to Tony Elena, from today, you give in custard. Okay? Mondays, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, up until 12, 12 o'clock. That's what you give. And she did that. And over at that year, and you can go and check the records, had the best bird in, in the combine, Koteng combine, the bird was 7004, won the best bird. He won five races in his club and he won the middle distance averages at the age of 82. Mm. which is unbelievable. So that's how the name Custard came about. And so I then, the next season, which is 2018, I said to myself, why break something mm. that's not broken? So from 2018, every week, actually two weeks before the first race, up until the last race, my birds get custard. I added two products. It eventually ended up to be 11 products. And I added the two products. And I would give it, and the thing is, what are you doing? You're doing preventative. Mm -hmm. Because obviously all these combinations, they're getting small quantities of, let's say, amoxicillin, small quantities of, of uh, you know, the other products, uh, coxin product or whatever, ESP3 or whatever, or CAN or whatever. <clears throat> so they're getting small quantities. So you're, you're maintaining your bird's health right through the season, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And... I mean, the results talk for themselves. 2018, when I changed, I arguably had the best season in the history of the TRPF because, I mean, I won the short distance, the middle distance, the long distance, the classic averages, the young bird averages. But I didn't just win a single bird. I won all bird as well. I won every single average that there was to win, including a couple of fed wins. And then in 2019, I did the same. 2020, I had 11 federation wins. I mean, that year I won the combine averages against 200 or whatever, 300 or whatever pigeon fences. And the following year, 2021, I ended up second to Kevin, my brother. He won the combine averages. I was second, but I still won the fed averages. So I won four years in a row. And if you think about it, there are seven averages. I won all seven averages for four years in a row, excluding the short distance average one year where Johan Hamilton beat me with two points. I don't think that will ever be done no, again. That's, that's, that's and, and the scary part is if you add my points together on, on the orbit averages, if you add my points together, mm. over the four years, the guy that was second was 21,000 points behind me. Sure. That is seriously, seriously. And, and you can only achieve that if you've got a family of pigeons, and you have good medication. Like I said, sick horse and doesn't want to race. And, system. and then obviously the other big difference is that number one and two. I give number number one on basketing day. It's a slow release. Okay, It's energy based. So when the bird, you remember you're feeding 16 grams. So what, I, what happens is the bird's drinking. Now while he's drinking, he's eating. He doesn't realize it. Okay? And especially on the middle of the long distance, that you know when it becomes hot, they don't want to eat. Mm -hmm. You know that. Mm -hmm. okay? So now I'm saying, I've got to make sure he's got enough power to do the job. And that's where obviously number one makes a difference, because you know when it gets hot, they drink more. Mm -hmm. So they're drinking energy that they don't, that your bird doesn't have. Mm -hmm. Do you understand? Because yeah. your bird's eaten less and my bird's eaten less. And then when they come back, I have a quick release. So what happens is when they land and they drink, it releases immediately into their system and they can recover quicker. So those are the two fundamental differences. Okay. Yes, I treat for cancer, a canker once a week, which is on a Sunday. Mm -hmm. you know, I give my, my feed additives in between. Um, malaria. Malaria I treat on a Sunday afternoon. And in the old days when we still had milk when I used to basket on, 
Yeah. One millennia. Yeah. I used to basket on that. I give them always a basketing day an IOD. And that's just to make sure that the thyroid gland is stimulated. Yeah. You know, so I do that. So, and then I'll, what I do do is, remember we always basket Thursday night. Fridays. Always I give my birds by God. The entire yard. Stock birds, raised birds, everything that moves on that property gets by the crop. Why? I neutralize the crop. Remember, you've given antibiotics and what have you. And probiotics, do you ever give? So what I do, what I do is I will give fungus, I'll give fungus, fungus uh, product on the Wednesday because I've treated, remember I treated yes, for 12 yes. o'clock. Yeah. You know, with, with, uh, with antibiotics. And so they get a fungal overgrowth. Mm. And so I'll give them something for fungus on that. Um, I will give carbo boost, you know, a carbo product or some protein products, obviously, you know, that's yeah. the feed additives. Mm -hmm. And I mean, you can see what your birds need, you know, you, you should be watching what they eat, you know, yeah. and then you give them accordingly, you give them those products. But I think the bicarb thing is a very important thing on a Friday because you neutralize the whole crop because you're building for next week. And then what I do is Friday night, I will give them a probiotic. Okay. Understand? So, Bulgarian yogurt, for example, is fantastic. I mean, you can get Bulgarian yogurt through the week, mm -hmm. you know, and products like cinnamon, mm -hmm. you know, if you've got wet dropping, cinnamon binds the stomach very quickly. So those are things that you, you know, and then obviously each guy does his thing. So to me, it was easy. Custard, one and two, rice. Custard, one and two, rice. Easy. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't have to think about it. Now my birds get everything every week. Mm -hmm. I don't have to, and what, I, sorry, I, I need to correct myself because what I would do is I'll have a I'll have a tank a week because remember you're giving very little quantities yeah, yeah. in the custard, so I'll have a tank a week where I'll, I'll I'll give them a little bit of flat job or pit front cells whatever you and then the week then the following week I'll focus on proxy. I'll give them sulfazine for example for you know for a day or two. Then the following week I will go and I say breathing. Then I'll focus on breathing. So so that so once very good for yeah day. and then deworming obviously. Um, I deworm every three weeks on a Sunday and I will put the dewormer on the food morning and night and in the water. Is that for all the worms? Tape for worm. tapeworms, everything. Uh, yeah, and I use endoworm from, from Bayer. Mm. So it's a cheap product, it's mm. a good product. Uh, I'm sure you sell yeah. deworming products as well. So I use that with the birds. So every three weeks they get dewormed, although I don't have, I've got a tennis court, so I don't have grass. Mm. I think guys that have got grass should be worm every two weeks. Yeah. I think it's critical in, in racing pigeons. Yeah. So yeah, you know, that's my that's my system tossing. What I do is when I get to distance, yeah, I think the, two weeks before the first race I come back. Then I start doing power work. I'm sure you've seen with athletes, you know, that they peak at a point which now they've now been to Springfontein, seven hours on the wing, they've got the muscle, they've got everything, and I bring them back and I give them short tosses. And then I start tossing less, 10 at a time, and they chase each other. So, you know, mm -hmm. I get to a point where every 30 seconds I'm releasing a basket and they chase each other. And I come back, you know, and I give them sort of a speed work, mm -hmm. you know, to, because what you want to do is the day of Winburg. When, those, when that pack comes out, mine comes out and says, it's 30 coats, bah, they hit the road. You don't win Winburg at home. You win Winburg at Winburg. Because that first pack that breaks away, they don't catch them. No. You know, and you need to have one or two in that pack. Yeah. And so, so that's what I do. I do the speed work. You know, for that week, week and a half. Okay, now thanks Mark. It's been very, very interesting. I'm sure we'll do it again. No, nah, sure. And uh, the panthers will find it very interesting. And there are a lot more questions we could go on for hours, but I'm sure we'll do it again. And thank you very much for for you know much for welcome. sharing your knowledge with us. You're most welcome. And if anybody's got any questions, you know, they can perhaps just channel it through to you and we can and give them answers. Yeah. Because I think at the end of the day, you know, on a podcast, whatever you you, you know, you, you can only tell, I can only tell you what you're asking. Yeah, 100%. But I'm sure there's pigeon fancies out there that, that are saying, but what about this? Yes. What about babies and what about, yeah. you know, how do I see in the next? No, that's why I think we'll have, we'll have another there. one and then we'll, yeah. ask, we'll get a lot of questions coming in and then we'll ask the viewers questions next time. Yeah, I yeah. think that, that that will be a good idea because yeah. some other guys don't know. Yeah. So, that no. is what it is. Yeah. No, thank you very thank much. You. You're welcome. Thanks, Mark. Great job. Okay.